Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Lippy. Um, today, we're going to have um, a presentation about Jupiter um, at NERSC. Um, but before that, let's get through a couple different items. Um, so as per usual, the plan for today's meeting is to have a really interactive session. Um, we don't have too many people here today either, so please feel free to raise your hand um, or just speak up if you have a question um, or if you want to share an announcement. Um, we you know, want to encourage people to uh, interact with us and interact with each other during these meetings. Um, so the plan today is to first go through some announcements um, and some calls for participation. So this is information that's um, available in the weekly email, but we'll just go ahead and um, go through it in case you missed any of it. Um, then we're going to try something a little new. We have some trivia questions. Um, I personally love trivia and I think other people tend to enjoy it as well. So you can test your knowledge um, in, you know, today we're doing a couple sort of Jupiter related things or Python related, but uh, we might do all, you know, all kinds of different things in the future. Um, then in case anyone has anything they want to share about what they've learned recently about the system. Um, and then, then we will go ahead and go into our talk with Kelly um, about Jupiter. So, um, uh, first of all, please, um, if you want any more information about what's coming up, uh, make sure to check the weekly email. But um, here I'm highlighting, so on uh, July 12th, there is going to be an e ECP seminar on writing clean scientific software. Um, then there will be another spin-up training. So this is um, about the spin platform at NERSC, um, which is offered uh, pretty frequently. The next one is coming up June 21st. Um, there's going to be a really great um, <clears throat> session, which is called Crash Course in Supercomputing. This is for um, mostly for novice parallel programmers, um, but it might be of interest to people who have some experience as well. Um, and so that's going to be on June 22nd. Um, again, any information um, that uh, is listed here, you can find in the um, weekly email for like, to, you can find all the links there. <clears throat> uh, there's going to be a fun training. Uh, so this is the Fortran users of NERSC group. They're hosting a modern Fortran basics training, which is going to be on the 10th and the 11th. Um, and then there's going to be um, a training using uh, Chapel, uh, UPC++, and Coarray Fortran. These are these are happening on the 26th and 27th. And so remember, you can um, go to the weekly email for these links, or you can check out the uh, training events page on nurse.gov. Um, in the next couple of months, there's a lot of um, different uh um, conferences and workshops coming up. Um, so there's uh, this one, which is in situ infrastructures for enabling extreme scale analysis and visualization. That deadline is August 4th. Um, there's also the US RSE um, Association Conference. Uh, the deadline for talks and posters is coming up um, on June 19th. And then there's also a workshop deadline if you want to participate in that, which is on June 30th. Um, there is um, the sixth annual parallel applications workshop. Um, this is happening at SC, uh, which is supercomputing. Um, so the deadline for that workshop is July 24th. Um, and there's another SC workshop here, um, a containers workshop, which has a deadline August 18th. So again, there's a lot of different deadlines. Please make sure to um, look in the um, uh, email. Uh, there's also registration for Confab 23. This is um, the ESNet uh, community meeting that uh, happens yearly, and the registration for that is open as well. I believe the meeting itself will be in October, um, so uh, if you're interested, uh, you can register to attend that. Um, I am able to see chat, so if, in case anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in chat. I can't see, my screen's not big enough to also have the participants open. So if you raise your hand, I might not be able to see. Um, so if someone else wants to call it out or just go ahead and unmute and ask if you have any questions, please feel free to do that. Um, great. Okay. So let's get to the part that hopefully everyone is super excited for. Um, again, this is something new we're trying. So um, we want to start doing some little trivia sections, um, partially to uh, challenge everybody. 
maybe you'll spend more time reading through these docs so you're ready for trivia next time. Um, or maybe you already know all this. So the, the goal is to have little questions about uh, HPC programming, all kinds of different things. Um, and if you want to submit trivia questions, you are more than welcome to. You can send those questions to um, me or Charles or to our sort of general email um, at nurse community managers and uh, maybe one of your trivia questions will be featured. Um, so today to trivia, you will not be able to input your answer into like a, a quiz system. You're just gonna have to hold the answer in your head and then uh, you can uh, you can share it in chat at some point, um, not right away. So don't give the answer away if you know it right away. Uh, just hold it in your head. And then you can spam the chat with what you think is the right answer. And then we'll I'll reveal it after the fact. So we have two questions today. The first one is a Python programming question. So if you are a Python whiz, you may know the answer to this question, or you may learn something new. It may not be as trivial as it seems. The first question is, what is the output of the following code? So there's a little code snippet here in gray, and there's a couple different answers. If you know the answer, please do not put it in the chat immediately. Just hold on to it for a moment. Um, and try not to go open up your Python interpreter and type it in, um, unless you really don't know and you want to learn and you want to try it out, uh, then feel free to do so. But think about it for a minute. Okay, on the, I'm gonna count down from three and then put your answer in the chat. All right, if you know the answer, all right? Three, two, one, go. Cool. Okay, I've seen C A C C A B C, and someone wrote Z. Thanks. That's yeah. That's a really good answer as well. <laughs> um. So, uh, I guess I don't. I maybe I shouldn't reveal the answer immediately. Maybe we should discuss it. Does anyone who uh thinks it's A want to defend their answer? We have a couple of people who said A, they don't think this is uh, a reasonable thing to ask Python for. You can type it in chat if you want, or do you wanna share, does anyone wanna share? How about B? It's a bad answer, but I think that the point of the exercise is that this code is supposed to do something completely unintuitive and B was the most unintuitive. Okay. And then we have some C. C and B are kind of similar. Who thinks C? Oh, Koichi is rethinking. Oh, okay. That's my goal is just to stump Koichi because Koichi knows everything. So, <laughs> okay, I'm going to reveal the answer. The answer is C. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So Andrea said, I'm guessing there isn't an if sta a statement. So else would throw a syntax error. Um, so you can go ahead and put this in your, um, in your Python interpreter, I did double check this um, and it does work. So Python has a cool thing. Again, this is something that I, I didn't actually know about Python. You can do a for else statement. So you can have a for loop that does whatever you want it to do. And then as soon as I is not, or, you know, whatever your for iteration or, you know, uh, statement is, as soon as that is over, the else will, will um, uh, take, take effect. Um, and range in Python is, um, as I think Sam has mentioned here, it doesn't include the endpoint. So because the step is one, it doesn't actually reach three. So it goes one, two, and then it does the else. 
Um, so yeah, this, I, I agree. I think this is a little unintuitive. I didn't realize you could do a four else in Python, but you totally can. So maybe this will, uh, uh, change your, your Pythoning from the future. Um, how is it different from adding code right after the loop? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't have a good example of why this use, like what exactly you would want. Like maybe you have some kind of unique, Thing that you're trying to achieve and and under a certain circumstance you wanted to take place um but maybe the answer is that you have this option if you want it but maybe you don't need it i don't know <laughs> so cool great okay i'm glad to see some people are learning some things i'm great glad to see i stumped a couple people okay the next question is um a jupiter question and kelly feel free to chime in and uh quiz people about this a little bit um, so this is to whet your appetite for today's, uh, um, presentation. So which of these Jupyter server types charges NERSC hours? So A is shared CPU node, B is exclusive CPU slash GPU node, and C is configurable job. Um, and so the question is which one of these, if you were to launch it and use it, which one would be charging your nurse hours? So keep keep your question in your head or keep your answer in your head for a moment before. We ask people what they think. Okay, on the count, I'm going to count down from three, then put your answer in the chat. All right, three, two, one, go. Oh my gosh, it's almost unanimous. Okay, so people think that it is both exclusive and configurable. And since everyone seems to think it, let's just check if that's right. It is, yay, well done. So yeah, so um, I maybe Kelly will tell us more about this. And Koichi is also asking, Koichi doesn't know what a configurable job is. So um, maybe Kelly will address that during her presentation. Um, cool. Okay. Anything you want to add, Kelly? Or oh, uh, congrats, everyone. Everyone's very well prepared. Um, I don't have a screenshot of the configurable job, but I can definitely <clears throat> talk about it when I get to the slide that, um, you know, when I'll, when I'll be talking about the different server types and how it's different from the preceding two and how also we kind of think on the Jupyter team that this page is a little misleading and we're going to be, um, changing these uh, server names ever so slightly for a bit of clarity um, in terms of the current uh, state of things and also some new features we're bringing in. Oh, great. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Kelly. Wonderful. Okay. So before Kelly begins her talk, um, I did want to give people a chance. We like to hear what people have been learning about, what they've been doing, um, and oops, sorry. Um, and I, I've already seen a couple of people learn something today from our Python questions, so I'm really glad to see that. Um, but in general, if anybody has anything that they've learned, not just today, but maybe since the last NUG meeting, if anyone would like to share, um, this is your opportunity to share with, with the group. Um, uh, again, most things take practice. I love this, uh, this uh, cartoon. You can change it to say anything here, you know, how you learn to do x well well it just takes practice um so i think that's the same for using hpc um does anyone have anything they'd like to share Okay, well, feel free to do so or just ask more questions in the chat today. 
Um, so let's go ahead and move on to our presentation from Kelly. So Kelly, I'm going to stop sharing and go ahead and take it away. And please also um, feel free to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, your role at DERSC. Um, cool, thanks. Uh, so my name is Kelly Rowland. I'm in the user engagement group here at NERSC. Um, I've been at NERSC for almost five years. Um, I started in the data science engagement group and have recently moved over to our user engagement group. And one of my favorite things that I do here is to work on our Jupyter deployment, because um, I think Jupyter is really cool. Um, it's a very human way of accessing high performance computing resources. Um, and I think it's just kind of like the way of the future, right? Like classes, huge classes at, at large and small institutions everywhere are training students and future generations in Jupyter contexts. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we meet users where they are, we offer features that they want to use and, and Jupyter is one of those. So my goal for this talk, um, you'll see I've, I've put the title of the talk is using Jupyter at NERSC, a primer. Um, if nothing, by the end of this talk, I would like you to know how to get to Jupiter at NERSC and how to get help with Jupiter at NERSC. So I'm not going to go into any extensive details on the back end. Um, if people are really interested in that, we can give it a different talk about that. Um, but this is just an overview of various different features um, and just getting, getting folks a little bit acquainted with Jupiter and what you can expect when you get there. So. What is Jupiter? Um, at NERSC, we talk about Jupiter and it's really in reference to a collection of many things. Um, Project Jupiter itself is a big umbrella of a lot of different efforts. Um, that includes some things that we do work with like Jupiter Notebooks um, and uh, Jupiter Hub and Jupiter Lab, but also other things um, under Project Jupiter that we don't necessarily work with. So. When we talk about Jupyter at NERSC, we talk about users accessing shareable documents called notebooks via this Jupyter Hub deployment that we say. Um, so what do you do with a Jupyter notebook once when you've got it? And, and I'll talk about how you get to a Jupyter notebook, but what, what is the point of these things? You can put code to run in your Jupyter notebook. You can um, put equations and visualizations in narrative text so you can use things like markdown for rendering equations and writing text to have a narrative people write books in Jupyter notebooks actually um and you can put in interactive widgets so you can see in this bottom right um here is an example um kind of one of project Jupyter's favorite canonical examples is the Lorentz equations because they make these really pretty um graphs so that's um it's a, it's a very richly featured um interface and you can use Jupyter Notebooks for a lot of different applications. Um, a lot of people use it for data cleaning and data transformation, looking at simulations, modeling. Um, you can load plots and widgets inline right there in the notebook. So it's very popular for data, data visualization. People use it for running machine learning as well as processing output and all sorts of workflows and analytics frameworks. Um, so I've mentioned that it's a very popular service. Um, We've seen a, a pretty steady increase um, historically in running folks running Jupyter at NERSC. Um, so right now we're up to about 12 or 1300 unique users a month, um, which is, uh, you know, comparing that to our 3000 users per month who connect via SSH, it's a not insignificant proportion of the users of our, of our user base who are actively working in the system. So um, it behooves us to provide um, this Jupyter interface for people to use. Um, OK, great. So how do I use Jupyter in Uh The shortest answer to that is to go to your browser and point it to jupyter.nurse.gov. Um, and what lives at this URL, so to speak, is a Jupyter deployment um, that the Jupyter Council at NERSC uh, manages. Um, we're a, a cross group um, team within NERSC um, who work to support Jupyter and provide new features and developments. So what does the Jupyter Hub deployment itself actually do? It handles a number of things. Um, 
you'll log in through federated identity, um, which is something that you're probably familiar with in terms of logging into Iris or our help desk. Um, the Jupyter Hub then um, spawns a notebook server for you somewhere in the NERSC system, depending on which server type you choose. And I'll talk about that shortly. Um, <clears throat> the hub manages communication between what you put into your notebook and the notebook itself. Um, it manages any processes that get spawned out of the notebook and it keeps track of those processes. And there are also other um, additional services, like we have uh, cool little menu links to the Jupyter related documentation if you have a question. So the, the highest level flow looks like here on the left, you reach the authentication page. Um, when you reach Jupyter, there might be a note about such a system is down right now and you can't reach it through Jupyter. Um, once you've authenticated, you land on um, the control panel page, which um, allows you to choose a server type. And then once you're in on your server, you have a notebook. Um, you, can, you can work with your notebooks and you can have many different notebooks um, open. I've always got a bundle running for my own analyses that I do for, for other efforts at NERSC. Um, so how do you choose a notebook server to spawn? Um, we talked about this a little bit. And uh, right now, when you log in, you'll see these four different types of servers on Perlmutter. Um, so for this to the left, we have a very common use case, what we right now call the shared CPU node server. This launches your notebook on one of the login nodes on Perlmutter. Um, it drops you into the same Python environment that you would expect on login, um, and you can submit jobs with this. Um, it's, it's called a bash magic command, this exclamation mark at the beginning of the command. That's an that's a IPython notebook feature. And since you're on a login node, you're sharing that login node with other users, other processes, maybe other notebooks. Um, there are 40 of them at Perlmutter, so, so you've got a little bit of leeway, but we generally ask that folks be good citizens um, on, on login nodes, either in Jupyter or otherwise. But if you've got you know, a big data set to process or you wanna use the GPUs or um, you're interested in just a little less noise, you can use one of these other three servers, uh, server types um, in Jupyter. Come on, advance, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so in the middle, we have these exclusive CPU or GPU server types where your notebook gets um, sent to a job allocation um, via Slurm. And with this, you get one CPU node or one GPU node for your notebook. Um, and this does, as you all uh, are astutely aware, use NERSC hours. Um, and then further to the rightmost um, on your screen, we have the configurable job. And what this does is let you, so if you click on the, um, the start button on configurable job, configurable job um, a job does not get submitted automatically, um, whereas the exclusive CPU, new, CPU and GPU node jobs just submit a job. The configurable job takes you to a selection menu where you can say, maybe I need to use four GPU nodes um, and you can input four for the number of nodes if you're, if you're running a larger, um, GPU-based application through the Jupyter Notebook, or if you'd like to change the time um, on the job. So that's um, the configurable job offers a little bit more flexibility in terms of your job parameters. And you can choose either a GPU node or a CPU node or multiple C um, GPU nodes or CPU nodes, whereas the exclusive um, servers here just have this default value of one node for so long and the configurable job itself um, allows you to uh, put in, it, it's sort of like you have, you end up with some drop down menus which are akin to writing the S batch headers and then that all gets sent off to Slurm to be scheduled um, as a batch job which you have interactive access to through the Jupyter Notebook. So we've picked our notebook server, uh, then what? Then we get into the Jupyter Lab interface. So you might see, um, if you've logged in, you might see something like this. Um, this is sort of a, a most trivial example of a notebook where you can, in the top, uh, what's called cell here, you would do your import statements of other Python modules that you need. Um, 
you run a couple of Python code uh, commands, and then you can render a plot here um, right in line in the notebook. And there's a couple of fun features you can see down at the bottom. Um, I'm using so much memory, so it's good to keep track of that if you're on something like a login node um, to understand how much memory you're using. Um, you can see in a couple of places this says NERSC Python. Um, that's what's called the kernel, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. Um, over on the left is our file browser. So you can use this to get to different places in the file system, open your various notebooks, data sets. Um, you can also open files which are not notebook files in um, JupyterLab. You can open text files. Um, you can also open use JupyterLab to open a terminal in the browser, which is quite convenient. Um, a couple things that we're particularly proud of is um, that Jupyter Lab features what are called extensions. So people can write code extensions to the interface, and um, they can either be standalone, uh, live in a GitHub repo, or something like this. Or we can do what's called upstreaming, in where the Project Jupyter says we think this is a great future, and we'd like to put it into the sort of base. Um, uh, deployment of Jupyter Lab so that everyone who has Jupyter Lab has this too. And so we've developed a couple of extensions at NERSC um, with some previous interns that we've um, hosted. And the uh, ex and some of these extensions have been upstreamed into Jupyter. And so uh, one thing that's a nice convenience is that um, in this top left, you have uh, your favorites. Um, so if you um, very frequently access somewhere in CFS, um, it can be very tedious to type that whole path all the time, but you can just favorite it, um, you know, kind of not unlike a browser. So this is pre-populated with your home and your scratch because we know that people like to access those, but you can add however many favorites to quickly switch between different places in the file system. You can do that with this little star button. Um, other cool things, if you click on the file uh, menu item, you can open from path, uh, you can click on this open from path item to jump to anywhere in the file system. So if you do know you need to get to somewhere else, um, if you're working in Scratch and you need to hop over to CFS and you don't want to click through this whole file browser thing to go all the way back to the root and then get back to CFS, but you know the path you're looking for, um, you can open that from path. Or if you've been there recently, you can um, add that. Uh, you can just use this recent uh, feature here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I mentioned uh, kernels. Um, so the kernel is what actually runs your code. So this is kind of the extent that I'll talk about what you might think of as like the, the back end of Jupyter. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but we'll, uh, I'm talking about them because uh, this is a very useful and popular feature. So you have your user who's using the browser to access Jupyter in their notebooks. And the notebooks are each talking to a kernel. Um, this might be NERSC Python, um, which is our default Python module. Uh, NERSC also provides other kernels. So if you're interested in Julia, you can load one of, you can pick a Julia kernel and then you can write Julia code in your notebook um, and just run that. Um, we also provide R kernels if you're an R programmer. And so you can um, write your R code in, in a notebook. Um, our teams uh, have several kernels which include machine learning packages, so PyTorch or TensorFlow. So you can load one of those kernels and use those applications right there in the notebook in the Jupyter interface. And this is um, the reason I introduce this concept of the kernel of, of how Jupyter actually runs your code is because the most common question we get from users about Jupyter is that they have their conda environment in the terminal, which is very useful, very productive. They like working with it. And they want to know, how can I use my conda environment in Jupyter? And the answer to that, there you can do this several ways, but you can create a kernel from that conda environment. So we have, um, We'll include these slides, and the slide has a link of the documentation, um, which includes how to do this. You don't have to, you know, take a screenshot of this or anything like that. Um, but if you activate your environment, your conda environment, and install ipy kernel, 
um, and then use IPy kernel, um, this IPy kernel command, you can create a kernel spec file, which Jupyter will look for and see, oh, there's a kernel in this path that I'm looking for. And then you can pick it, um, you can choose this kernel in, um, in the Jupyter interface. Um, so just to talk about that a little bit more, um, you can see if the kernel spec is installed into this uh, verbose directory. Please, command. The kernel spec points is a way to pass the path of the environment into the command. Good question. There's a question in the chat about the kernel spec. Um, the, the question says, when I use this command, the kernel spec points to the wrong path. Is there a way to pass the path of the environment into the command? Um, and there is a way to set environment variables in your kernel spec. So if you have um, this in in your kernel spec file in additional uh, customization and additional customization that you can do in your kernel spec file is to set um, <laughs> environment variables. But it is the case that if you're running um, if you run that command from your activated um, conda environment that you should that the paths should all line themselves up not automatically but correctly when the command when the ipy kernel command is run from the activated conda environment and so you'll see that this kernel file that gets created um, points to the conda python um, it uses this ipy kernel launcher command and it sets up your um, display name that you would expect to see in Jupyter and what language you're working in. So Python um, tends to be a, a majority usage here. Um, but you can also do things like set environment variables in your kernel spec. So you can add, um, you can set your path, um, LD library path, any other environment variables you like to use. Um, you can actually set these on the command line with the ipy kernel install command, um, or you can go back into this file and add them um, manually yourself. Okay. If you want to get uh, really fancy, you can create what's called a kernel helper script, where instead of, so these past two slides, the first argument here has been, um, the Python binary in your conda environment. But instead of pointing to that, you might point to a kernel helper script in which you can do many things, um, basically anything that's valid in a shell script. You can export environment variables, you can load modules, um, you can do you can do a whole ton of setup. And um, but the most important thing is that your kernel helper script at the end should have this Python exec statement. Um, so that um, the notebook can connect through appropriately. But this is like really the most flexible approach that you can use um, in terms of setting up a kernel in that um, you can load modules with it and export environment variables without using, um, without having to write them out in the arguments here. Um, a lot of folks uh, who use Jupyter are interested in using Shifter um, in their environment. And you can also do that. Um, so you can create a kernel spec file, which um, has Shifter as an argument, which includes the image name um, and the path to the, where the Python lives in the image. Um, but then the rest of the um, file looks pretty similar to the other one. So if you can create this kernel and then your notebook will run in your Shifter image that you're interested in. So these are sort of um, the most flexible custom customization avenues for users to like load up a rich, a richly featured environment, um, which and then use a notebook in that environment to work through their workflows. Uh, Jupyter issues. Um, it happens. It's OK. It happens to me. It happens to everyone. We direct a lot of output to a log file in everyone's home directory who uses Jupyter. Um, so if you do something like cat home dot Jupyter dash Perlmutter dot log, you'll you may see a lot of output that looks like this. Um, are R and Julia kernels customizable too? 
I so there's a, the question in the chat is are R and Julia kernels customizable too? You could create a custom kernel with R or Julia as a language, I believe. The preset um, nurse kernels aren't really editable. Um, they're sort of defaults for people to pick. But um, I think if you can create a conda environment for a given language like R or Julia, then you could make you should be able to make a kernel spec file out of that. Um, but that, that's a very good question. So if you're running into uh, problems with Jupyter, um, this happens sometimes you get like a 500 error. You might look into your log file and see if there's anything um, meaningful to you. Uh, if there's not, don't worry, we got your back. But sometimes this is useful if you've got um, some Python packages loaded that are causing conflicts with the way that um, Jupyter Lab runs. And usually if we're helping a user debug their Jupyter issues, this is one of the first places that we look is in their log file. So um, as a summary, uh, please visit jupyter.nurse.gov in your browser of choice to use Jupyter at NERSC. Um, once you've gotten well seated uh, in, in that interface, you can use kernel specs to use conda environments or shifter images in, to run your notebook. Um, the Jupyter team at NERSC um, works really hard to make Jupyter work and work better for you, for all the users. So um, a couple of folks have asked uh, about running jobs um, for Jupyter notebooks, which only use a single GPU. So right now, if you're using a GPU, an exclusive GPU job, it grants you an entire GPU node on Perlmutter, which is four GPUs, but some applications um, can really only leverage one right now. So we're expecting to release that feature um, this month or next um, in combination with renaming the servers to make a little more sense in this context, as well as upgrading Jupyter Lab to version four. Right now we're running version three um, and Jupyter Lab four um, brings hub performance improvements um, that we're looking forward to. It loads uh, larger notebooks in a way that's more intelligent. It only loads what you're looking at as opposed to the whole notebook all at once. Um, we don't have a very specific time frame for that because we're waiting on some of the developers of the Jupyter extensions that we use to upgrade their extensions for Jupyter Lab 4 compatibility. But we hope to um, get that upgrade in place soon. Um, so we are always looking for new ways to empower Jupyter users um, to use uh, the Jupyter Hub and the HPC system through the Jupyter interface. So um, feedback, advice, questions, even pointers, um, we always welcome at our help desk at help.nurse.gov. Um, so thanks everyone for your attention here. Um, there's, some, there's some stuff going on and there's some active debugging going on in the chat. Um, one tip that in uh, if you're using a kernel file in the JSON uh, that Will Holtz recommends adding the metadata, this entry metadata debugger true, which enables the use of the integrated Python debugger. That's cool. Um, Jake asks, what is the best way to install specific Python packages that you may need for your code? Um, Generally, we recommend that users install packages through Conda. Um, so you would activate, you would create and activate a Conda environment and then use Conda or sometimes even pip to install packages locally for your own use. Um, you can also put these Conda environments in somewhere like CFS if you want to create an environment um, that your whole team can use. But uh, the, the short answer to that is Conda. <laughs> Sam, Sam is asking in the chat how to open a ticket. Um, you can go to help.nurse.gov um, and that um, should prompt you for an authentication. And once you've authenticated, then you can open a new ticket. There should be a button that says like, open a new ticket. Um, and then you can fill in um, what your uh, specific error messages that you're getting are. That's a very nice segue also for uh, reminding everyone what our next uh, uh, presentation is going to be. Uh, before that, thank you, Kelly, for your uh, fantastic presentation. 
Um, these uh, slides will be available uh, on the NERSC website afterwards, uh, as well as the recording. Um, so if you have uh, more questions or you want to reference these slides, you'll have access to them. Um, and yes, our next presentation in July is going to be about how to submit a good ticket. Uh, basically, how to submit a ticket so that you can get uh, a solution quickly, uh, rather than sometimes what happens is, you know, we get a ticket and we just have to ask for a lot of information that you probably could have given us the first time around, but, you know, maybe you weren't aware that that was something that would be helpful. So we want to make sure all of our users know what kinds of things we look at if we're diagnosing, you know, a diff different types of problems and how you can help us help you get a solution really fast. Um, so yeah, that's great. So thanks so much, Kelly. Um, why don't we let people sort of stick around for another couple of minutes. I'm going to pause the recording. Um, and then, uh, let's see if I can do that. Uh, stop recording.